This month, we've got um, Mathieu O'Neill, Professor of Communication in the University of Canberra's Faculty of Arts and Design, on, and he's here to talk about his research um, around Wikipedia. Um, some of you may have um, been looking forward to see him talk last year's WOW event, which he unfortunately wasn't able to attend. He just um, let us know that he lost his, his wallet was nicked, basically, <laughs> uh, uh, which is a bit of a bummer. Um, but yeah, so I thought that's, it's been about a year since I think his uh, initial paper came out. I think that was right. And I thought it would give him a chance to jump in and give us an update and um, hear all about what he was going to talk about um, at WAW or whatever else he's been working on. So um, yeah, I'll hand over to you. And um, as I said, we'll um, stop the recording at the end and let everyone ask any questions. But yeah, over to you. Thanks very much, James, and I'm really glad to talk to everybody. Um, um, so I presented very similar slides yesterday at the Ascolite event, so apologies if you were there. Uh, but there are two big new news items that I can share with you today, so it won't be exactly the same. So I want to talk about some of the projects I've been working on around information literacy um, in the last few months. Um, so there's been a few new kind of projects, uh, publications and concepts that I've been playing around with with different people. So it's great to have this opportunity. And I'm coming at you from Ngunnawal country in Canberra. Um, so just to clarify, I know a lot of this, I don't know, maybe I don't know what you're familiar with and what you're not, but just to make sure we're on the same page, I thought I could just define what I'm not going to be talking about, which is media literacy, um, which is very much concerned with questions of representation and power, uh, how the media represents the world. So what I'm focusing on today is information literacy, which is just much more basic, uh, less complex question, um, which is you know where, whether something is true or false. Uh, and I'll explain why we don't try. We well, we're actually, we're going to start talking uh, addressing media literacy as well, but we not we haven't done it so far. I'll explain why in a minute. So, some of you probably familiar with this concept of the attention economy, which is <clears throat> extremely prevalent nowadays. In the early seventies, the economist Herbert Simon said, "You know, we have a wealth of information, and we can't pay attention to everything." So, this was in the broadcast media era. So now, of course, with social media, there's so much more possibility for creating content. And so getting people's attention is, is very important. So that's the first kind of guiding principle that we have. Um, and so how do we deal with uh, what the philosopher Kim Sterelny from the ANU called in 2006 epistemic pollution, that we have a, an, an environment where there's a lot of stuff that we're not sure about, um, weakly authoritative statements. So how do we verify? So for example, this is uh, from a disinformation campaign that ran from 2015 to 2020 called Secondary Infections. This is a fake video attributed to Greenpeace. Uh, this came from Russia. And then the fake letter from the Center to Protect Journalism. Or is it the Center for, I don't know what it stands for? Committee to Protect Journalists, sorry. Uh, so completely fake, um, but you know, they look at authentic. So how can you, how can you tell? Um, so there's been some analysis of what's known as truth decay, or it's a funny play on words and tooth decay. Um, and it's a very American centric, uh, but what they did was they looked at different historical periods and they, where there was a lot of, you know, pol polarization and discontent. And they found that some of these characteristics such as um, blurring of between opinion and facts existed in previous periods. I think they looked, you know, one period in the, 19th century, one period in the early 20th century. But what was different about our, our time is this declining trust in institutions, uh, formerly respected sources of factual information. So that's the other consideration. So the first consideration is overabundance of information and um, you know this kind of not knowing what's true or not. And the other one is declining trust in institutions. So this the declining trust is uh, local and so the ANU has been running the selection studies since 1987 uh, and it's pretty damning like 70 percent of people believe the government is only looking out for themselves 
only 12% believe it's for all the people. And same with the news. Um, when asked people, when people ask, I think you can trust most of the news most of the time. By the way, the digital news report, which it comes out. So my center, the News and Media Research Center, is the Australian arm of the Reuters Digital News Report, and we released this year's edition today. So you can download it from the News and Media Research Center or from the APO. Um, so you can see there's declining trust in the news as well. 43% uh, in Australia in 2016, 41% today. Well, that was like last year, actually. So I don't know what I can't, I should have updated it today. And the lowest figure, the US, only 26% of people in the United States, I mean, pretty, pretty incredible. Um, I think you can trust the news. So that's the other thing. Um, so you're familiar with this acronym, uh, which is how people uh, still use in classrooms, you know, how to address a claim or a website. Is it current? Is it relevant? Is it authoritative? Is it accurate? What is its purpose? So crap. Uh, so you'd look at the about page, you look at the um, the design, you know, is it, is it, uh, has it, when has it been updated? Um, does it have a .org or a .com because a .org is better than .com or does it have ads? Because if it's got ads, it's a bit suspect and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the problem with this is that this kind of checklist approach results in cognitive overload. Like you, there's too many things to think about. And what happens is that people uh, often just latch onto the most obvious thing. So if it's a .org, must be good because if it's a .com, it's commercial. So that's not necessarily the case, but that you just latch onto the most obvious signal. Uh, visual uh, cues or design cues are, don't work anymore because anybody can make a really good looking website. And also it wastes a lot of time because you have to think. So um, the first principle then is <laughs> when there's an overabundance, you should waste, you should not waste your attention. So you should fact check fast. The fact checking has to be fast. That's the first principle. The second one is when there's distrust, you have to be, you have to give people a reason to believe. And so fact checking has to be inclusive. So one of the uh, concepts that's come out recently is this concept of critical ignoring. I mentioned it yesterday. Uh, and it is an article. So they've <laughs> their own article in the sort of the news media at the top. And there's a, a sort of a peer reviewed article at the bottom. And you can see the names. You can't see all the names at the bottom, but you can see them at the top. So that's why I've got both. Um, so it's a, like I said yesterday, it's like a super group of academics because there's uh, this guy, Ralph Hertwig, he's got this concept of nudging. Uh, Anastasia Kozireva, I'm not sure what she's, what, I can't remember what she's known for. But Sam Weinberg is the guy from Stanford, he's a professor from Stanford who came up with this concept of lateral reading. And Stephen Lewandowski is a psychologist who does a lot of work on that, who's been basically editing the debunking handbook for the last 15 years, which is a, a very good resource. Uh, if you don't know it, it's it's they they release it every year or they've been releasing it. So they all came together and they came they they put all their ideas together and they came up with this concept of critical ignoring. So you should not. It's about knowing when not to engage, knowing what you should not look at. And there's too much information, so we don't want to you know we don't want to be critical. You know you don't want to engage. You don't want to be have critical literacy. You want to have critical ignoring, which is uh, interesting. So the one we use, of course, is natural reading. Uh, don't feed the trolls is pretty obvious. People want your attention, just don't give it to them. Just ignore them or report them if they're being offensive, but don't waste your time. Self-nudging, it's about controlling your information environment to, to have better benefits. I'll just give you a quick definition. Um, so are you familiar with this Stanford experiment? I, might, I mean, uh, something you might have, I might have, you might have seen this in a previous presentation. I think Rachel would have maybe mentioned it at, at, at WOW, or is that something you're familiar with or no? Okay, so, um, well, first of all, the Stanford experiment is a kind of joke because this, the original Stanford experiment is people, you know, getting people to mistreat others as having role play. And if you're an institutional, setting you know uh, you get people to pretend to be prisoners and guards and you, they, they'll do all sorts of nasty things that was in the 60s so they're redoing it uh, consciously or subconsciously and um what they did was they gave they gave these three groups of people five minutes to check out claims by these two organizations the academic american academy of pediatric pediatrics 
and the American College of Pediatricians. And they said, look, here's two statements, you know, which is legitimate, which is valid. Statements about bullying or about obesity, I don't know, whatever, just similar kind of areas. And the only problem, of course, is that the American Academy of Pediatrics is a legitimate organization that's been around for seven years. It's got like 65,000 people, doctors, and they're really, you know, they're a legit organization, whereas the other one is got a few hundred people, 600 people, and they're basically a hate group or defined as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, because they're basically against uh, gay, gayness, gay kids, all sorts of things like that. So very conservative, reactionary organization. So unfortunately, the students, the PhD students and the historians got it wrong. Um, they either thought they were equally valid claimants or even that the second one was better than the first whereas the pro fact checkers they found out in 30 seconds uh what was what and they knew exactly which claim or which claimant was worth your attention so how did they do it well they used lateral reading uh which uh, you probably know um so it's the same as critical ignoring really you don't read vertically you don't go deep you don't go into a claim or a website you look away look to the side open another tab search for the claim uh is the source reliable is the claim correct fantastic if it is if it's not let it go the idea is that misinformation disinformation mixes the real and the fake very expertly and it could take you so long to untangle these threads that it's you know you'd waste hours doing it and that's hours of your time that you get that you've given to white supremacy or anti-gay rhetoric or whatever. So this is how they summarize all of this. Uh, so different types of information. So for distracting and low quality information, you have better self-control, you self-nudge. There's false and misleading information, you use lateral reading. And for trolls and malicious actors, you minimize and you don't feed the trolls. So self-nudging is um, basically like, or being aware of the link between your behavior and the architecture of the environment. So, for example, avoiding things like, okay, I'm going to work really hard for 20 minutes and then I'm going to reward myself by looking at a video because uh, you, if you look at one video, then you'll end up looking at three and you'll spend 15 minutes. So it's just being aware of how you will react to certain technological affordances, I guess. Okay, so this is the bit, the bit I can I can skip. Um, oh no, actually, it's not. So this is something that I did with Rachel and another colleague from the ANU in uh, February. So we we did a submission to this parliamentary uh, committee on foreign interference, and we said, all right. So we 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 have two ideas. We have this idea of um, information literacy. So this is uh, what I've been developing with Rachel and the other one is information health so that's more network analysis it's about um, looking at conversations on Twitter on Reddit and then deciding to what extent using network metrics and textual metrics to what extent there you know uh, there's uh, if we if we make a identify a partisan debate let's say and we can say people are on either side of that debate because they've linked to well-known partisan figures like for example you could look at the voice uh, now, um, as an example of that, which is what we did in this submission, um, and then you can do some network metrics of to what extent people are engaging with people on their side, or if they're engaging with other side, or to what extent they're using in civil language, to what extent they're linking to authoritative sources, such as Wikipedia, for example. Um, and so the concept of resilience is something I quite like because it's, it appeals to a lot of people, but it's a little bit controversial in the education space because uh, some people think it kind of psychologizes um, social issues and it puts uh, the pressure on children uh, to be strong and to work everything out for themselves. When in some cases, you know, there are social factors for why people are, uh, you know, are feeling uh, pressure or are being affected by misinformation or by other things. But I don't agree that you should relinquish the use of a term to conservative people. You have to explain why you're going to use it. So um, we're writing an article for a journal called Synergy, um, and we're going to try and explain, you know, well, I'm going to try and explain why I want to use this term resilience. Okay, so the three 
the three principles that inform this are non-partisanship, speed, and transparency. So non-partisanship, uh, because we're dealing with kids for information literacy, you want to be as inclusive as possible. And so you don't want to turn people off. So some people that I work with, they disagree with that. They say, well, it doesn't matter, you know, if, if, you know, but if you're dealing with children, with parents, with teachers, you really have to be careful um, and you have to be as, as wide as possible. And you want to reach people who are on the other side or who are believing in conspiracy. So you really want to try and make it as uh, non-controversial as possible, which is why we don't talk about media literacy so much. Speed, I've already explained, and transparency. Uh, because um, the opposite of uh, distrust and conspiracy theory is transparency. Um, conspiracy is always alleged there's some secret cabal doing something. I mean, even you know, on Wikipedia, you have conspiracy theorists who say there's a cabal controlling the encyclopedia. I mean, they, those, those people are right, of course, because there is a cabal. I'm kidding. <laughs> but um, anyway, the, the point is the, the way to, 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 to inspire confidence is just to be completely transparent and say, this is how the sausage is made. This is how the knowledge is being collectively produced. And of course, a wiki does exactly that, but also for news. So uh, this guy from uh, BBC's Global News Division said that transparency is almost more important than objectivity. Um, and he's, there's a quote at the bottom, news today still has to be accurate and fair, but it is as important for the readers, listeners, and viewers to see how the news is produced, where the information comes from, how it works. And then you have other instances like open source software, open source intelligence, like uh, Bellingcat, open data, it's not as clear cut because the data that's released isn't always curated properly. And the people who are then supposed to look at it, you know, anybody, they don't necessarily have the skills. So open data is a bit more complicated. And of course, Wikipedia. Um, so, you know, although this idea that you have an evolution in trust from uh, guarantees offered by the author. So the first encyclopedia was by Diderot. So you trust Diderot, then you trust the brand, Britannica, and now you have probabilities created by transparent auditable processes. And there's all these comparative studies, which I got from the Age article that came out um, last September. I was interviewed by this guy after the, in the second conversation article, and it's good when that happens because he's a science writer and he had all these great references. So I got them from there. Uh, Wikipedia, blah, 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 it's all good. You know, it's got uh, history, it's got policies. So I don't need to tell you that. Okay, a few issues. I was interested in this idea that even though there's complete transparency, there could still be some problems in front of everybody and everybody, you know, there's nothing, they're just there. Um, so first of all, the organized manipulation of content and then systemic imbalances. So. Um, most of you would know about the project capture in Croatia when the uh, Wiki, the uh, Serbo Croatian or Yugoslav Wikipedia was split into different group projects in the early 2000s and the, they were too small basically. So the Croatian one was basically taken over by far right uh, Ustachi, I guess, people um, who, you know, sort of excluded uh, dissenters and the Wikimedia Foundation actually had to intervene uh, a couple of years ago, and I think one admin was excluded. And they're trying to, there wasn't enough people to have that kind of evening out, e uh, leveling out of, of disputes. It was too one sided. Uh, then you've got, of course, PR firms that also uh, sometimes, uh, you know, try and influence content for their clients. And this is an example I think Rachel would have given last year at the WOW. So, there were some cases where uh, about 80 accounts were editing non-controversial topics to, you know, bump up their credibility. And then they started editing the Ukraine and uh, Russia pages and all that kind of stuff, trying to, you know, make it look like they were, um, so, you know, basically uh, altering language to minimize object objectivity of pro-Western accounts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, systemic imbalances. So on Wikipedia, you also have a problem, as you know, with the representation of women. Um, there's only 20% of biographies of women. You all know that, but I don't know if you know that one. 
when women are featured, they are represented differently and more negatively than men. According to a 2015 study, the word divorced appears four times as often in women's biographies in English Wikipedia than it does in comparable men's biographies, which emphasizes the prevailing societal focus on women's private lives and existence in relation to men. I mean, that was pretty, that made my head spin a bit that way, I must say. Okay, so what did we do with all this? So we created these six lessons. Um, with the uh, ACT affiliated schools uh, and they went from the most foundational issues like you know what is a fact what is uh, how do we know what we know uh, then we use the uh, metaphor of finding a sandwich on the street the number three to introduce this idea of lateral reading then we introduced the idea of ad hominems of people using emotional language and you know why it's okay to be mad at a friend, but why are people getting mad to people they don't know? And then we use the, uh, the metaphor of a um, red car. So, you know, your parents buy a red car and suddenly you start noticing them, you know, um, the frequency illusion, basically. Uh, just because something is ubiquitous doesn't mean it's true. So same thing happens sometimes online, you start seeing something all the time. And then the last one, Garage Dragon, is about um, finding proof for, uh, for statements, for, for claims. So this was uh, collected as a booklet, which is available for free download on the APO. And we did it in uh, different uh, classes uh, in four schools. Uh, and I did it with Rachel Kaneen. There's a new guy who's uh, coming in from the Faculty of Education, Andrew Ross, and we're going to reapply next year. So one first new uh, thing to say in relation to yesterday, there's a video which I can show you. Street cake. Imagine that you come across a cake, or perhaps someone offers you one. If you had never met the person offering the cake, you would be right to refuse it. You have no way of knowing if it's okay or not. If you knew and trusted the person who gave it to you, like a friend, you might accept it. If you were hungry and liked cake. If you found the cake on the street, would you eat it? You can't check if it's okay, so probably not. Think of unfamiliar information as being like cake on the street. If you are not sure if it is okay, check. Takeaways. You are not sure about new information, check. How do you check? Do a search with Google or DuckDuckGo. Look at the Wikipedia article. If the article is okay, for example, no warning banners, you have the answer. Okay, so that was a world premiere for that. Um, skip ahead um yeah so I'll, I'll be interested to, to know what you thought about that one um i saw something I, I thought the music was a bit loud actually uh and there was something else i thought was not right but you know it's a work in progress um so basically uh summing up uh good traits for exercising critical literacy are often ill-suited for sound digital information literacy to be critically literate, you need a lot of time. You need to, to be able to think contextually. Uh, you have to have lots of different approaches. Um, there's always bias, but traditional forms of authority are still important, whereas to be digitally literate, you need quick, confident decision-making. Uh, you don't want to spend your time. You do lateral reading and you must have, I mean, facts must be as objective and. I don't know if that's any different than the other one actually, but, and it's about processes, not institutions. 
Okay, um, so then I can show you some bits of uh, an art, a chapter that we have coming out in a book. So these ideas, um, these ideas were, you know, controversial for some people. So we had the conversation article that came out in 2021 that sort of started this whole thing where we realized there was a lot of resistance from teachers and we wanted to, to kind of change the conversation a bit. So it had a big impact. Um, and uh, for 72 hours, they said, okay, there's gonna be some commenters. And so we, we engaged with people. There was one guy who made like 23 comments. He was by far the greatest number of comments. And he was extremely negative and, <laughs> and obtuse, I would say. Um, and uh, you say, you know, he was pretty offensive. You, um, the mob comes into play. One thing for sure, Wiki is not suitable as an educational resource of any kind, except as an example. And he also said, I'm very worried about the state of universities if teachers are recommending it and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but these vehement objections were a minority. There's only 10 people out of 52. The majority was supportive, 31. And others were neutral or made comments that were not related. So in fact, just because there's people who shout and make a lot of noise doesn't mean that they're the dominant um, view. Um, there is a perception that, you know, people are thinking of Wikipedia in a way, in the sense of how it was in 2005, 2010. They haven't really under, there's, there's a real lack of knowledge of the, the institutions, um, the processes, um, people don't understand. So Darius Jemielnak is a Polish Wikimedia guy, Wikipedian, um, he's written a book about Wikipedia and he says, you know, it's improved substantially. Uh, one guy, <laughs> There was a couple of response, responses in the, co the conversation to this uh, negative guy. And uh, one guy said, you know, I suspect her hostility is caused by sort of knowledge elitism and fear. And of course, then commentaries say, oh, chill out. It's just an article, mate. You know, like he's, of course, he got out of there immediately. So, you know, even more annoying, like, you know, he makes all this noise and then somebody responds and he's like, oh, don't, what are you doing? You know, you, you, you're taking this way too seriously. Anyway, um, so we had a, workshop that was with people the not the people we're working with although one of them one of the uh, co-researchers did attend but uh, it was open to people in independent schools as well as from the uh, directorate so directorate is just for public school the affiliated school project that we do there's 14 schools in the ACD that take part they're all public schools um, the there were two teacher librarians who were actually both from private schools and they were incredibly enthusiastic. And they said, you know, uh, it's a great opening to research. Uh, my, we're all, so they really, they, they saw themselves as advocates. And sadly, we had to say to them, well, you're working in private schools, so we can't actually uh, make you part of the project, <laughs> sorry. But, you know, of course we shared the resources with them and all that kind of stuff, but we couldn't work with them. Um, Okay, another is, so basically, yeah, that's another finding is the teacher librarians were incredibly supportive. Uh, Prue organized, uh, I hope I got the hashtag right, an event last year where we presented what we were doing. And actually we got a new public school teacher librarians from the ACT who joined because of that. So that was really good. Um, I did, I presented a keynote address at the school uh, at the SLAN uh, New South Wales Professional Learning Summit in September 22. Um, the, info, the the librarians from New South Wales, they've got a whole framework called information fluency. So we're sort of debating you know, information resilience, information res, uh, fluency. Um, then, uh, sorry, these people talking, so it's putting me off a little bit. Um, yeah, so we had a lot of interest from teacher librarian publications, connections, uh, pre-organized that. Uh, we, um, reprised and expanded the first conversation article, Access, which is uh, New South Wales, provided the lengthy, so I've reproduced it here. If you haven't seen it, uh, positive review of six fact checking lists for kids. And as I mentioned, Synergy, which is the Victorian uh, Association, I think is, we, we're going to do something on information resilience versus information fluency. So teacher librarians are very uh, positive and they get it, which is great. Um, then also we had a uh, debrief sessions, um, and they 
they were really uh, surprised and they changed their complete, you know, so usually what happens is when we present people, I say, oh, wow, I didn't know all this. And yes, it's really good. Um, and uh, sorry, can I just give me a second? Sorry about that. I just get flustered when I, there's a not I'm very sensitive to noise. So um, they would definitely use WikiKids with year six. Uh, yep. Anyway, so yeah, so teachers basically say we can change our ways and they've identified teacher education in universities as the place, as the battlefield, basically, where this, has to, this cultural change about trusting UPD has to happen. Rachel has started to incorporate some of those ideas in some of her training. Um, okay, in terms of the children, the school kids, uh, with the way we verified is not the best way because we, you know, we sort of made this up as we went. Um, and we, what we should have done and what we want to do in new iterations is have activities. So we ask people, ask children to check something or to react to something, and then we verify how they do that. And we want to do that in before the program, and then we'll do it after, which is what we did in this case as well. But we did it straight before, because we want to do it, you know, four weeks in advance and then four weeks after to make sure to see whether these skills actually stay. Um, so basically we did a survey, we asked questions and they, the fact checking had improved, but the trust in Wikipedia had not. And that's the reason why when we have the um, videos, we wanna sort of reinforce the Wikipedia aspect in everyone. So we understood that we have to really kind of reiterate that a lot of times. Okay, so next steps. Um, so they, we did a symposium in September um, where Rue was there, Amanda was there. Well, I mean, Amanda wasn't there physically, but she participated remotely. Um, and we have a report that's sort of in limbo at the moment, but I, I, I want to get it out second half of the year. Um, we've had some preliminary meetings about doing micro credentials. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. Uh, I, you know, it's kind of a area I don't really know much about. Um, it could, it could. We, uh, my idea is to use the report as a kind of, you know, broadcast and see if there's any if that helps us build something. Uh, but you know, we can use it anyway. Sum, summarize where we're at, and um, we'll we'll revive that uh, that work in the next couple of months. Uh, okay, the second piece of information I wanted to tell you after the video is that the teacher librarian grant was not provided. I got a negative answer today from the make, uh, US Embassy, so that will not proceed straight away anyway, um, sadly. So and it's funny because yesterday at the Escalite uh, event, uh, somebody said, I'm in Queensland, can I still participate? Of course you can participate if you're in Queensland. Um, Okay, another thing we're going to do is to expand to Indonesia. Uh, we want to do this in Indonesia with high schools. And uh, we're going to do another uh, affiliated school uh, application, which we will uh, try and link what we did for the primary and secondary system to the high school. So this will include other literacies such as uh, Wikipedia literacy, um, which is, you know, of, I often say to people, we're not saying use Wikipedia blindly, we want to increase people's Wikipedia literacies so they can detect when a, when a page or an article has got a problem and they can they can know when they can trust the page. Uh, other types of literacy, privacy, etc. Um, finally, this is part of a project that I've been doing for the last couple of years, the Digital Commons Policy Council, which tries to sort of recognize volunteer labor that produces digital commons such as open source software and Wikipedia. And um, we working on the sustainability of digital infrastructure. And we also working on digital commons and environmental sustainability. And I think that's it.